lessons. Good morning, everybody. Come on, I flew all the way from America. Good morning, everybody. All right. It's great to be back in India. So, especially for an event like Tech to Innovate. There we go. So, I toured the, uh, the grounds a little bit yesterday when they were setting up, and I have to tell you, um, you're in for a treat. It's going to be awesome. Between the sandboxes, the experience, the music, it's going to be a phenomenal event. And it's designed to not only entertain you, but to inform you, and most of all, to inspire you. And when I think about the digital era, the era we're in right now, the last 10 or 15 years, inspiration is the key word. 15 years ago, we couldn't have imagined the amount of connectivity, uh, the internet uh, options we have, social media, um, the access through mobile devices. So inspiration really defines the digital era. And I think what's important to know is the architects of the digital era were people just like you, just younger in their careers, they developed the infrastructure, the content, and the applications. And now it's your turn to inherit the digital era and bring it forward. Those people had their own journeys, their own stories, just like you have your own story. And I want to start by telling the story of the company that I work for, Corning Incorporated. So Corning's based in a small town in upstate New York. This is actually our headquarters, very peaceful, very rural. Uh, we've been around for 168 years, as Shireen said, and we're basically a bunch of engineers and glass scientists, a company of about 50,000 people. And one of our very earliest products was the glass envelope for Thomas Edison's light bulb. And we take a lot of pride that we were there in the very beginning to help launch electricity and light for basically society. And since that time, we've reinvented ourselves multiple times through innovation. So our story is really one of the intersection of innovation and inspiration. And let me give you a few examples. So does anybody here have a smartphone? Anybody? Of course. Everybody does. The question is, who doesn't have a smartphone? Maybe somebody left it in the bus or Uber. Feel sorry for that person. But everybody has a smartphone. Just think about that for one second. At no other point in human history have more people carried the same object on their body as a smartphone in 5,000 years, not eyeglasses, not watches. So we're at a point in history where more people carry the same object on their body than ever before. And if you take out your phone and look at it, there's dozens of components in that phone. The thing you touch every day is glass, most likely glass developed by Corning and manufactured by Corning. In the last 12 years, we've been used on 7 billion devices. That's part of the Corning story, and to me, that's inspiration. Let me give you another example. Has anybody checked a photo or video on their phone in the last hour? I'm guessing everybody, except the person who left their phone in the Uber, right? But everybody's looked at a, at a photo or video. Have you ever thought how that photo got on your phone? Probably not. You just take it for granted. But in the network that connects the internet is optical fiber. And here's a spool of it right here. Corning was the first company in the early 70s to develop low-loss optical fiber. Let me tell you how this works. That photo you're looking at is digitized into zeros and ones. A laser pulsing 100 billion bits per second, 100 billion bits a second, think about that, goes down a fiber roughly the diameter of a human hair. And not only one laser, you can put 80 lasers with 80 different wavelengths down the same fiber, the diameter of a human hair, each pulsing at 100 billion bits a second. That's how the internet works, and that technology was developed by Corning. So that's part of the Corning story, and to me that's inspiration. And then lastly, I assume people have been in a car or a bus over the last week. Everybody had to, right? To get here or to travel. So the combustion process, whether it's gas or diesel, makes nasty chemicals. And those chemicals can end up in the air we breathe. Corning developed an emission controls technology to scrub those bad chemicals before they enter the atmosphere. Since 1974, Corning technology has kept four billion tons of hydrocarbons out of the air we breathe. Four billion tons. 
4 billion tons of nitrogen oxide, 40 billion tons of carbon monoxide. Those are stunning numbers. That's part of the Corning story, and to me, that's inspiration. So I've given you three examples just in the last 30 to 40 years where Corning's made a big difference on society to help the digital era, smartphones and connecting the internet. And all these speak to innovation. Now, the key to our success, one of the keys, and you may find this surprising, is the willingness to fail. If you're going to innovate for a living, eventually you're going to fail. In fact, Shireen quoted the statistics, 90% of innovations aren't successful. But just because something fails doesn't mean you're a failure. It means the project was a failure. You get judgment, you get experience, you, intu you get intuition, and you innovate again. And if you don't have this willingness to fail or learn to fail, you simply can't be an innovator. If you look at our strongest leaders, whether they're coaches or business people or people in the media like Shireen, they've all struggled at some point in their life. They've struggled, they've learned, they've persevered, and that's how they get to be success. So failure is a prerequisite for success. So as you write your own story and go forward in your own life, if you want to innovate for a living, you have to realize you are going to fail and have setbacks, but you have to get up, dust yourself off, and keep moving forward to get to that big invention. You look at Thomas Edison, one of the most prolific inventors ever. He did the light bulb, the phonograph, telephones. He tried to mine iron out of the, out of the earth, a failure. He tried to do early motion pictures by putting his head in a box with pictures and audio. It was a failure. His teacher said he was too stupid to learn as a, as a student, yet he has a thousand patents, one of the greatest inventors ever. Fast forward to modern day Jeff Bezos. I recently read that two-thirds of Amazon's ideas don't go forward, but the third that do change society. So a very important lesson if you're going to innovate for a living. Let me make it very personal to Corning, how we've failed in the past and it's led to success. 1968, we came up with an idea to strengthen glass to penetrate the windshield market in the U.S., the automobile market. We took what we thought was a great idea to the U.S. automakers, and they said, eh, not doing it for us. Don't like the price point, don't like the performance. It's basically a failure. So when we had that conversation, they said, but oh, by the way, these new emission standards are going to be deployed in the U.S. and throughout the world, and we need a way to clean up the atmosphere. That was the birth of the emissions control product I talked about before. So that was the first success out of the failure of windshield glass. Then fast forward to 2006, 2007. The earliest smartphones had plastic on them. They scratched. We got a call from a major OEM brand and said, we want to put glass in the first smartphones. We went back to the glass we made in 1968. We tweaked the formula, we made it on some new assets, and in six months we were in production. And that was the birth of the Gorilla Glass business. So out of that failure in 1968, two major successes for Corning. So our story, the Corning story, is all about infrastructure. Your story can be about infrastructure, equipment, apps, content, Everybody has a different story. Look around you. Everybody's on a different journey. The key thing I want you to ask yourself as you walk around here over the next couple of days is, is your story going to matter? Will it matter tomorrow what you do in your career? Will it matter a week from now, a year from now? Will it matter in 168 years? It's your story. You're going to write it. You just have to be willing to fail and learn and keep moving forward because you are going to inherit the legacy of the digital era. Let me give you a couple examples of people you can interact with here at this Tech to Innovate event. Mark Johnson. So Mark Johnson lives in California, San Francisco, and in 2002, he was inspired by street music. Over time, he started a movement where he would take popular songs and have musicians from throughout the world play parts of the song on their local instruments, and then he blends this together in an entire music video and puts it on YouTube. And this band is called Playing for Change. And he takes the proceeds that they raise from this and he works on social causes, a lot of work with kids for arts and uh, music schools in developing countries. And he'll have a sandbox here Saturday and also his band's gonna be playing here Saturday night and you don't wanna miss it, it's gonna be phenomenal. 
And Mark has a love affair with Indian musicians. He's worked very closely with Tushar Lal, who I had the pleasure of meeting yesterday. And Tushar runs the Indian Jam Project, where he takes popular songs and plays them with Indian instruments and Indian musicians and takes his own take on it. And he's done Imagine Dragon's Love as Mark's band playing for change. And Tushar and Playing for Change will be playing together tomorrow night. And once again, you really don't want to miss it. Then, are there any gamers out there? Any gamers? A couple? I'm sure, right? So gamers love the infrastructure I talked about. You guys and girls are all about feeds and speeds, right? And all this is enabled by the optical fiber I talked about. Now, I know PUBG is a great game now. Before I came over, my son tried to teach me how to play it. After 20 minutes of running around in my underwear shooting people on my own team, he said, Dad, just give me the phone. I, I can't watch this anymore. But gamers have their own story to tell, whether you're playing or writing the games. And Xiaomi has a phenomenal booth outside, a gaming zone, which you have to check out if you like PUBG. But once again, it's all about finding your own journey and writing your own story. Now, I've talked a lot about individual stories, but sometimes our stories have to come together as a group. And when we think about the environment, this is a group story. The environment's in trouble. And I talked a little bit about how Corning has tried to make improvements, significant improvements in air quality, and we're very proud about that. Another cause we're passionate about is gorillas. So because it's our namesake, Victor Gorilla, and you can see it in our booth, we've worked in the past to support uh, rescuing endang the endangered species. Several species of the, of the gorilla are, are endangered. And we work closely with Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund. So going forward, we'll be working with them, giving them mobile devices that helps them with data collection and tracking the gorillas. And it's really a story that needs a good ending. So I encourage you, you can't do everything to save the environment or, or all the causes, but pick one or two causes on your journey through life as you write your own story and make sure you're giving back. For us, it's through how we clean up the air and gorillas, but everybody has their own cause. Now with that, I hope you have a great show, I hope you're inspired, and I hope you're on your journey to writing your own story. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Hang in there, we're getting the chairs on stage so that we can have a little bit more of a conversation on some of the issues that you just spoke of. I don't know if you guys saw that gorilla there in the background and if you haven't visited the Corning stall, maybe you should. I believe he has a name. I want to start by asking you, you know, from the light bulb to the smartphone, what a journey it's been for Corning almost 170 years. We talked about disruption. We talked about how many of the companies of the past are no longer relevant today. How has Corning managed to stay relevant over a century and a half? Couple, couple reasons. One, we're based on glass and glass ceramics. So we inherited a legacy of a phenomenal material. It's a material we all take for granted. It's all around us, but rarely do we stop and say, hmm, why is glass so special? Mm. Well, it's highly transparent, it's thermally stable, it's chemically stable, it has so many uses. It can be used, obviously, for window glass, but it can be used in liquid crystal displays to put millions of transistors. It can be strengthened, it can go from extreme heat to cold. So we have this benefit of having a wonderful material to work with. But that doesn't guarantee our success. What we do is we've realized that when you're in business, any market segment, the ground underneath you is shifting, it's crumbling. Mm. Sometimes very fast, sometimes very slow. But you have to realize no matter how strong your market position is, there are competitors every day coming after you. So you have to run a little bit square, scared and you have to be committed to innovation, knowing that people are going to threaten you and you have to continue to evolve. I'll give you a quick example. CRT TVs. Some of you may not know, but the TVs used to be this thick yeah. for 50 years using cathode ray technology. Well, in the 70s, people started to make little uh, watches using liquid crystal displays, passive matrix, tiny, tiny. That was the beginning of the end of the CRT TV. It took 25 years for that tiny liquid crystal technology to turn into a 70-inch TV, but eventually did, and CRT is dead now. We transitioned from CRT to liquid crystal television yeah. by anticipating that inflection point and moving the company in that direction. So always run a little scared, always stay humble, and always innovate. Well, I, I think that's a key lesson. How many of you here actually watch television? I mean, what, consume on television. Anybody here who actually consumes on television? Or are you all on your smartphones? 
Wow, this is, this is the millennial generation that we're dealing with. Nobody's watching television anymore, and that, that's scary for people like me. But you know, you were talking about innovation, you were talking about disruption. This is the smartphone that we've all gotten used to. In terms of form factor now, with all the changes in technology, uh, and what you can do more with glass, what should we expect? What is the smartphone of the future going to look like? Um, it's interesting. We, we think about it all the time. Is a smartphone going to be gone in five years, 10 years, 20 years? We just don't know. I think the form factor is pretty cool because if you go back to the very first smartphones, the iPhone, for example, the form factor has not changed dramatically, right? It's very similar. So for 12 to 13 years, it's been that same basic size goes in our yeah. front pocket, our back pocket, incredibly functional. You pull it out, you look at it, you put it back, all the apps. I think there'll be other products, augmented reality, bendable, that may supplement it. But I honestly think the smartphone's here to stay for quite some time. The smartphone is here to stay. John, I want to talk to you a little bit about India because you are here uh, uh, visiting us. Uh, the in the world. So I think it's a very exciting marketplace for Corning. Our strategy in India is, number one, offer the best products. Mm -hmm. Wherever we're offering anywhere in the world to any company, we offer to the local brands and also the global brands, but also we try and tailor our solution to the Indian consumer. Sometimes we'll see some of the entry-level phone brands try and use a cheaper glass to save a couple rupees on the phone, but the poor person who's just buying their first entry-level phone, they can't afford to have a broken phone. They can't afford to fix it. They can't afford yeah. a replacement. So we've developed glass options for maybe 10 or 15 rupees more have some of our best glasses to protect that consumer because let's be honest, the Indian consumers put their phones through quite the test. Yes, right? we do. Yes, we do. We do put our phones to quite the test. But John, uh, you know, you're, you're every parent's nightmare because, uh, and I think Indian parents specifically, because even if a child comes home with 99 out of 100 on their report card, the parents are like, but where did that one mark go? Mm -hmm. And you were talking about failure and how it's okay to fail and that shouldn't weigh you down. Take me through a personal anecdote. You took us through what happened in 1968, which was a failure mm -hmm. for Corning, and how that translated into a success many years later. But personally, as a leader, take us through a personal anecdote of where you failed and how that changed oh, you. Great question. I'll give you a couple examples. So I went off to college, like we all do, wanting to make our parents proud. And I remember one of the first tests I took, I didn't fail, but I was awfully close to failing. And I was devastated. I thought I'd let my parents down. I remember writing a letter to my father specifically and saying, Dad, I did the best I could, but it wasn't good enough, and I'm not sure I can make it here. I'm going to try, but I'm not sure how well I'm going to do in school. And he wrote me a letter back, which I still have today. I keep it in my desk. And he basically said, look, if you do the best you can, that's all we've ever asked. And I'm sure it will be fine, and we're proud of you no matter what. And I think that lesson is so important. I use it with my own children and my leadership team. If you do the best you, best you can, People can't ask anything else, and sometimes it will be enough, it will be more than enough, and sometimes it won't be because the competition is a little better. But once again, because you failed a test or a, a product you launched wasn't successful, you're not a failure. That single effort was, and you can't let it define you. So that was a personal story. A professional story is about eight years ago. Oops. <laughs> okay. Um, I ran a, a project for Corning, and the project lost a couple hundred million dollars. It was a big project. We took a plant down. We built a new plant. We thought we had a key order. The customer walked away from us, and I lost that money for Corning, never made it back. I took accountability. I, I played back why we weren't smarter when we built the plant and set, assessing the market, and I committed I would make that money back and more for Corning in the rest of my career, which I think I have, but I've had some significant setbacks in the professional career as well. But you can't let it define you, and you have to realize it's just, as I said, part of the innovation process. Absolutely, and I think acknowledging the fact that things